Hello everyone, my name is Elijah David, this is the 12th hour, plus all the set of training congregation out down to the 12th hour. In the Liberty Hill, Texas, today is July 13, 2013, or in the sixth day of Abe, 2017, we will start our third service on this Sabbath day with the song in the title, Y'all will take care of you. <clears throat> Do not dismay what have Y'all will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, Y'all will take care of you. Y'all will take care of you. Through every day, or all the way, He will take care of you. your path of series of Yeshua's righteousness and as I had read to you earlier about it there in first, uh, second, uh, first, uh, second Corinthians chapter 5 we might go back to that but we know we've already had that so we're going to uh, turn to a few scriptures in the book of Psalms for our prayer thought scriptures uh, Psalms 5.8 Lead me, O Yahshua, in thy righteousness. And David is talking to Yahshua. That's who he communicated with here on earth. In thy righteousness, because of mine enemies, make thy way straight before my face. Uh, Psalm 7, verse 8. Yahshua shall judge the people. Judge me, O Yahshua, according to my righteousness and according unto mine integrity that is in me. Psalm 7, 17. I will praise Yahshua according unto his righteousness and will sing praise unto the name of Yahshua most high. Psalm 9, 8. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment unto the people in uprightness. Psalms 11, 7. For the righteous, Yahshua loveth righteousness, his countenance does behold the upright. Psalms 15, 2. He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Psalm 17, 15. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be sanctified when I wake with thy lightness. Oh no, I shall be satisfied when I wake with thy lightness. Okay. Psalms 18:20. 20. 
So they say, yeah, she'll reward me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. Verse 24. Therefore hath the Yahshua recompensed me according unto my righteousness, according unto the cleanness of my hands, in his eyesight. Psalms 22, 31. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. Who is this people that shall be born? The 144,000. So where is this time uh, zone uh, that we're talking about? Right now in the 12th prayer body trial that we're in. Psalms 23.3 He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Uh, Psalm 24.5 He shall receive the blessing from the Yahshua and righteousness from the uh, Yahshua of his salvation. Psalms 31, 1. And thee, O Yahshua, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. So how are we going to be delivered today? We're going to be delivered in Yahshua's righteousness. Psalms 33, 5. He loveth righteousness and judgment. For the earth is full of the goodness of the Yahshua. Psalm 35, 24. Judge me, O Yahshua, my Savior, according unto thy righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Psalm 35, 28. And my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. Psalm 36, 6. It says, Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. O Yahshua, thou preservest man and beast. Psalm 36.10 O continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee, and thy righteousness unto the upright in the heart. Psalm 37.6 And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noon day. He's talking about this here house of David today. Psalms 40 verse 9. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Though I have not refrained my lips, O Yahshua, thou knowest. Psalms 40 verse 10. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation I have not concealed. Thy love and kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Here's the great congregation. Psalms 45, 4. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of the truth and meekness and righteousness, and thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Psalms 45, 7. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, Elham, thy Elham hath anointed thee with the oil of the gladness above thy fellows. Psalms 48.10 According unto thy name, O Yahshua, so is thy praise. Unto the ends of the earth, thy right hand is full of righteousness. Psalms 50, verse 6 And the, and the heavens shall declare his righteousness. For the Yahshua is judge himself. Selah. Okay, that's uh, enough scriptures on righteousness uh, for our prayer thought. There's a, a total of 306 scriptures, or uh, six times that uh, uh, righteousness is mentioned in 289 verses of the KJV. So, there's plenty of them to read, and they're very good. For instance, in the next series of readings, he starts with uh, Psalms 51, 14. He says, Deliver me from the blood guiltless, O Yahshua, thy Savior of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing a lot of thy righteousness. Okay. Uh, David, uh, he, uh, he took innocent blood when he slew uh, Bathsheba, a husband, Uriah the Hittite, causing him to be killed in battle, to try to, try to corrupt his misdeed. 
trying to hide it. Trying to kill an, of an innocent man. Well, that's what David was talking about. Deliver me from blood guiltlessness, O Yahshua, thou art Savior of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing a lot of thy righteousness once I'm uh, delivered from this blood that I have, uh, that I'm guilty of. Psalms 51 19. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of the righteousness, with the burnt offering and the whole burnt offering. Then shalt they offer bull, uh, bullets upon thine altar. And in Psalms 53 it says, Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness. Okay. Psalms 58.1 Do ye indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do you judge uprightly, O you sons of men? And we're talking about, we're talking to the, to the house of Israel today in our day, the Adventists and the Davidians, seven day Adventists. The shepherd brought in the branch Davidians that uh, I was a part of the Gilead Center of 1973. They were asked the question, do you indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do you judge uprightly, O you sons of man? Psalm 65.5 By terrible things and the righteousness Wilt thou answer us, O Yahshua of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of them that are fall upon the sea? Okay. So it says in um, Psalm 69, 27, Add iniquity unto their iniquity, and let them not come into thy righteousness. Psalm 71, 2, Deliver me from thy righteousness and cause me to escape and climb thine ear unto me and save me. So remember it says, Deliver me in thy righteousness and cause me to escape. Psalm 71, 15. So we have to be delivered in Yahshua's righteousness in order to escape from the evil congregation. Psalm 71, 15. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day for I know not the numbers thereof. Psalm 71, 16. I will go in the strength of the Yahshua, Messiah. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. Verse 19. Thy righteousness also, O Yahshua, is very high. Who hath done great things? O Yahshua, who is like unto thee? Verse 24, My tongue also shall talk of thy righteousness all the day long, for they are confounded, for they are brought unto shame, that seek my hurt. Psalm 72, 1, it says, Give the king thy judgments, O Yahweh, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. Verse 2, For he shall judge thy people with righteousness, and the poor with the judgment. Okay. We're going to leave off there now. That, uh, that's enough for our prayer thought. We're going to pick up our main theme now, taken from time to reading uh, volume 2, number 35. And we're going to pick up on about the last part of page 9. And uh, it says, uh, Moreover, believing that Elohim had promised their kingdom unto him, and having been anointed to be king over Elohim's people, David doubted nothing. Recognizing his duty, he fearlessly went after the giant Goliath, who was defying Elohim and his kingdom. Well, who is the antipical Goliath today? Obama and company. And they're defying Yahweh's kingdom here on earth, has blasphemed it more times than one already. And have no fear whatsoever to speak evil of dignities and to go after even Yahshua himself when he appears at 144,000. To challenge them to a fight like uh, Lucifer did when Yahshua went back to heaven after his resurrection. He followed him up there. He tried to get into the, uh, the pearly gates where Yahshua had just entered into. Yahshua uh, turned around and closed the gate and uh, and this was there with his uh, angels, and he challenged Yahshua to let him in, and Yahshua wouldn't do it, so they had war right there at the Golden Gate. Yahshua cast him out, and he had to get in his flying saucers and come back to this earth. 
That's where it's bound for the next 2,000 years. That's why we have him here today, Lucifer. So it says, uh, Fearlessly went after John Goliath, who was defying Elohim and his kingdom. All right, this is what uh, Elijah David will be doing as soon as uh, the appointed time comes, when the kingdom is being directly threatened for the annihilation by the mark of the beast system when it goes into force. So it says, moreover, believing that the Elohim uh, uh, had promised the kingdom unto him, David, and hadn't been anointed to, to be a king over Elohim's people, David uh, is with a doubting of nothing, recognizing his duty, he fearlessly went after the giant Goliath, who was defying Elohim and his kingdom, and he was confident that the giant could not harm him. By the faith he freed his people from the power of the giant. By the faith he overcame the lion. And by the bear and saved the lamb. By the faith he knew that Saul could not take his life nor deprive him of the throne of, uh, of the Israel, which for David it would be the everlasting throne that he would establish. And David established that set upon it for 40 years, and then he passed it on to his son, that's Solomon. And Solomon set upon that throne for 40 years, and you know the rest of the story. Alright. Uh, no, there is neither beast nor man that can take your life or cheat you of the promotion. If you do Elohim's bidding, if you know that he who keepeth Israel, neither us. Uh, sleeps and no slumber, Psalms 121, 3 and 4. He knows all about you, my friends, every moment of the day and of the night, that he takes notice even of the hairs that fall from your heads, that whatever befalls you is but Elohim's own will for your own good. I say, if you know and believe that he is Elohim and the keeper of your bodies, and souls, in regards to what befalls you, you will be happy in it and give Elohim the credit for it, not murmuring, but glorifying even in your trials and afflictions. Isaiah 26, 4. Trust you in the Yahshua forever. For the Yahshua uh, Messiah is with the everlasting strength. If you wholeheartedly trust in the Yahshua, and if you and if the world should fall into the space and collide with the stars, you shall happen fly along with the Elohim, with the Yahshua. Let us now turn to Second Corinthians, the first chapter, and see if Paul knew by the experience with the Elohim, how the, uh, about the, how the Elohim or the Yahshua cares over him. Second Corinthians 189. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came under us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above the strength insomuch that we despaired even of life, but we had the sense of death in, our be uh, in, other, in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in the idea which uh, raises the dead, or we to trust in the Father, which raises the dead, because he raised his son first, Yahshua from the dead, Hebrews 13 20, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Now Yahshua, once he's resurrected, he can do the same thing, he can resurrect. Paul learned by the personal experience that it is futile to trust in man and self, that it, pay, that it pays high to trust in the Yahshua that he alone is able to protect and keep both the body and soul. Psalms 127, 1. Except the Yahshua build the house, they labor in vain that build it, except the Yahshua keep the city of the watchman, wicked but in vain. Many of the Elohim's faithful people had the same experience as Paul. Time, however, will not permit me to speak of more than a few. When we enter into the belief which the Bible recommends, then we are ready to enter into the experience which the Elohim or Yahshua wants this person to be in, which after all counts most undead. Let me first give you my own as a concrete example of what Elohim does when, he, when we let him. Uh, I just read you, but we're going to pick up now where we 
uh, I left off on page 16 of the Yeshua Righteousness. We're going to fast forward now to where B. Caliph was talking about, moreover, this Maytag agency was new, and when I went to work for them, they had but a small place. All the while I worked for them, though, they prospered and grew as did Laban, while Jacob worked for him. Okay. In three years' time, they opened branch offices all over the vicinity of Los Angeles and then erected a building of their own. Okay. Which looked like uh, a bank inside out, one block deep, and it was something like six, 60 feet wide. As to how the prosperity ended, I will tell you a little later. My unexpected success and the selling wash machines, uh, of course, was used as a boost pump uh, to, uh, for the other sales. Okay. Now, it says, uh, was a boost for the other salesman, and the sales manager became very inquisitive about my religion. The last I talked with him, he said to I me, mean, it must be wonderful to believe as you do, but you know, I could never be a 70 evidence. I then asked, why could you not be? And he replied, because if I begin to keep the Sabbath as you do, I will lose my job. Okay. He said it is better to lose your job than to lose your life. That's what I said, Dr. Howard said. And uh, the conversation ended. But the next time I went into the office, I saw a wreath hanging on the door and everything seemed to be upset. And I was told that Mr. Harney, the sales manager, had suddenly taken sick the night before and died early that morning. At that time, the head bookkeeper, too, became interested in discussing religion with me. As time went on, I discussed the same. I had discussed with Mr. Harney. And at last, he, too, said, Harley, it must be wonderful to feel as you do, but I could never be a Seventh-day heaven. And again, I said, why? Oh, I could not keep the Sabbath as my job, too, or end my job, he replied. Well, I said, it's better to lose your job than to lose your life, Mr. Barber. And surely enough, the next time I went into the office, I found everybody talking instead of working. And I told Mr. Barber, the head bookkeeper, was found dead that morning in his room. Believe it or not, that this is what happened with most men that they sold their conviction for the price of a job. Then later I thought that I should have something of my own instead of continuing to work for Mr. Schluter. So I was spending most of my time with the experiments on health suites. And as I then sold a washer only now and then, I was not too popular with the company. And as the company owed me some commission, decided to find out, uh, I decided to find out while they were held back. After discussing the matter several times with the sales manager, he put me off each time with a promise to see to it, but one day I, I pressed the matter harder, and as a result he said, Hard of, I am tired of, with this, and I don't care. You can quit. Next time I went in, I learned that Mr. Lisco, the sales manager, was discharged, and Mr. Foster had taken his post. Mr. Visco, you see, was the one who had quit, uh, not I. I then went to see the new manager about my commission. He promised to investigate the matter and let me know the next time I came in. He, he uh, though, did uh, the same thing Mr. Visco did. When I pressed the matter as hard as I did Mr. Visco, he too said, Hot, I'm tired of this the thing and do not care if you quit, particularly enough, though the next time I went in, I was told Mr. Foster was a sales manager, but this charge was no longer with the company. I still was. By this time, I had created enough business with my health suites to keep busy and was about to quit altogether. I then went to see Mr. S uh, S uh, S S himself about the aforementioned commission. But he received me very cold and plainly told me that I had nothing coming. I quit, 
But in the space of less than about six months, I think it was, he lost the agency and another man took over the company. This is the way his prosperity ended. Not long after I'd gone to work for this company and while canvassing, I met a woman whose husband was of the Jewish descent. But she was Scandinavian and a Seventh-day Adventist. She told me that her husband was terribly opposed to her religion. At one time he threw the, her Bible into the stove. She wished I could in some way help her husband change his attitude. I asked her to tell me that, uh, that I would like to see him in, in his home the following night. She promised to try it and then let me know. Uh, he sat down to several stages with me in his home with the family present. I was surprised though to find him very agreeable to what was presented. Altogether contrary to what his wife had told me, after I'd given him three studies, he called me aside, pulled his pants pockets inside out, and he said to me, You see, I have a big family to feed, and only three cents in my pocket. Before you came to me explain, I did everything to get a job but failed. In my distress, he continued, I prayed for the first time in my life. I asked the Yahweh to send me someone to show me what to do. When I heard you were coming, he added, I thought it was an answer to my prayer. And I was anxious to meet you, and that is why you found me so open-minded to your religion. But now, he said, I know that uh, Yahweh sent you. I asked him if he would like to sell wash machines, and he replied, I am ready to do anything you suggest. I took him to the company. I was working for him, and he went to work immediately, trucking with his own pickup, his wages, and a few sales of carriage brought him over 200 monthly. He owned the house he was living in, and, he, and his uh, living was not so high in those days, he was able to save a good share of his wages. At the time, he sold his house, bought a five-acre plot, and built a new house and a good poultry shed on the plot. And he told me that he intended to work for the company about 18 months, Long and by that time he would have his house in land all clear or somewhat clear. And then he could take he could make a good living on the five acre plot. Well it all looked fine. But one Sabbath morning he met me in church and told me that the country was to be taken over that day. He wanted to know if I would go with him and listen to his speeches while the transfer was being made. I reasoned with him that it was not the place to spend the Sabbath in. But he argued that if he were not present, he might hire another man his place, and he could not afford to lose his job. He therefore attended the business meeting. Shortly after, though, the new company discharged him. Consequently, he could not keep the payments on the property, and the trust company foreclosed on it. Then his wife died. Anyone can see that all these sequential events of the day closely tied one to another with nothing else in between. Could not possibly have been accidental or strictly providential. Now let me relate unto you another miracle that took place at about that time. One Wednesday I drove to the business section of Los Angeles. Having finished my business quite late in the afternoon and while walking across the street, I saw a woman driving toward me, but as I was almost to the middle of the street, I saw no danger for there was plenty of room for her to drive by. She nevertheless turned her car right square into me. Yes, she struck me from my left, and being overly excited, she could not stop her car before she missed, reached the middle of the block. And so she kept on going from the corner of the street to the middle of the alley. What happened to me, when the car struck me, it lay me flat on the street, and did it run over me. No, this did not happen because something greater took place. An unseen hand carried me on ahead of the car, lightly sliding my feet on the pavement, with my right side ahead and my left side against the car's radiator. After having made about half the distance before the car stopped, something seated uh, me on the bumper of the car, and I put my left arm around the car's left headlight. And I said to myself, Now, lady, you can keep on going if that's the best you can do. 
when she stopped, I put my feet on the ground and stepped away from the car. Just then, I discovered that the pencil I had in my coat pocket had broken into half a dozen pieces from the impact, but my ribs were untouched. By the time the car and I were surrounded with the people and three policemen searching for the man that got run over, but as they found no one lying on the street or pinned under the car, I told them that it was I who had been run over. They wanted to take me to the hospital, and when I told them that I was not hurt, I heard one say, He must be hurt, but he is too excited and does not know his condition. Then, then they made me raise my legs and arms up and down several times, after which one shouted, He's made out of rubber. The woman was accused of driving at 30 miles per hour. Then I walked three blocks from my car and drove to prayer meeting in Exposition Park Church, where in our season of testimonies I told them of the accident and the result. We are still living in the days of miracles, you see. After all these and other experiences, then came the message which we are now endeavoring to take unto the leg of sin. For the enemies of the message then left nothing unturned in their search for the something against me, rather than to make sure that they were not turned uh, down to the truth. They tried every hook and crook to pin something on me and to stop my activity, but found nothing, and as a rule, about 30 members of the church stayed in my special meeting each Sabbath afternoon. Then came the time that the elders of the church refused to let us use the church for our meeting. And they made us all get out. But one of the sisters who was living in a big house right across the church offered her place for the meeting. And there was a great uproar among the people around the church. Premises. Some were for us and some were against us. So it was at the house across the, from the church was filled that afternoon and many listened from the outside through the windows. The enemies failed to break up our meetings and the victory was ours. Next they forbade us to attend their church services and they began to disfellowship those who still wanted to attend our meeting. They tried to deport me too, but failed. Then they endeavored to get a court order against any of us going to the church on the Sabbath, but lost out. Once they called the police to have me uh, arrested on false charges, but I was disturbing the meetings. But after the officers in the police station heard my story and the deacon's charges against me, he commanded the two policemen who brought us to the station to put us in their car again and take us right back to the church where they picked me up. After this, the elders endeavored to put me in an insane asylum, where the city's manager of the Grand Day himself, a seven-day evidence, had come to this church. That Sabbath morning to lay down the charges and to see me carried away and locked in the asylum. After talking with me for a few minutes, though, the officer did not did nothing but to, to tell me that he would not bother me again. Then the 200-pound city manager felt smaller than my 35 pound weight. They did all those unbecoming things and many others besides they talked and preached against me. And though I had no one but the Yahshua defend me of any time, yet in all these, the victory was mine. When we moved our office from California to Texas where we had neither friend nor believer in the message that church elders were glad and through our work would then die, die uh, and though our work would then die out for sure, it nevertheless grew more than before, although this took place in the midst of the Depression in 1935. While hundreds and thousands of businesses were going bankrupt and uh, while well-to-do men were becoming poor, Yet we who started out with nothing grew prosperous. We moreover never took collections in any of our meetings, anywhere, and never made any calls for money. This holds a good still into our free literature that goes out week by week, amounts to hundreds and thousands of dollars a week after week. 
and uh, year after year besides the cost of building the institution. That's the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of dollars, okay. And today after going through the nightmare of supposing I might live a life of the poverty, as I explained before, my credit is unlimited. And the checks I write amount to thousands of dollars week after week and year after year. Although I'm not buying, own no property and have no personal bank account, furthermore I pay my secretaries as much as I pay myself and some of my workmen, I pay twice as much. Yes, there are as great miracles today as there ever were. Jacob too had no righteousness of his own, but he had a great zeal and respect for the righteousness of the Yahshua. For the Esau though, who had no regard for the righteousness of the Yahshua, sold his birthright only for a mess of parts. And that's exactly what we admit to any type of external texture, 1970, 2003. Antipical Esau, brother Stephen selling his birthright for a mess of pot. What a bargain was Jacob. As a result, though, Jacob became a fugitive. The first night away from home, uh, however, Elham met him and having given him a vision, Jacob put his whole trust in the Yahshua and faced to be faithful in all his duties. To start with panning around, uh, Jacob had nothing but faith in zeal. He was only a good workman, that is all. Uh, these quarters Laban immediately recognized and as Jacob as a result Laban not only offered under to give Jacob his daughter Rachel for a wife, but even devised a scheme by which to force him to take both daughters, Rachel and Leah, the only girls in the family. Moreover, although Jacob dearly paid for them with fourteen solid years of hard, faithful labor, he in the next six years became rich. Then on returning home, he wholeheartedly, honestly, and with free conscience said to Laban, This twenty years have I been with thee. My years in uh, thy she goes have not cast her young, and the rams of my, my flock have I not eaten. This is 31-38. Still further, when he was asked what he wanted for his work after fourteen years, for over, he chose the wages Elohim uh, would pay, not Laban. For he said unto the Laban, Thou shalt not give me anything, but let me pass through all thy flock today and remove from thence all the speckled, spotted, brown cattle, sheep, and goats, and take a uh, three days' journey apart from the rest so that there be no chance for them getting mixed. Today, all the sheep and cattle, speckled and unspeckled, are to be yours. But hereafter, all the speckled that shall be born from among the unspeckled, the apparently impossible, shall be mine for serving me. Laban was well pleased with the contract, and Jacob went to work. Elohim blessed Jacob's labor in spite of the natural impossibility, and within six years he became rich. Why? Because Jacob served Elohim wholeheartedly and implicitly trusted in him for his living. He wanted nothing but what Elohim would let him have. He knew that so long as he worked for the Yahshua, the Yahshua would leave him neither hungry nor naked. He knew that if the Elohim so clothed the grass of the field, he would clothe and feed him and his baby. Since Jacob was getting rich so fast and since his father-in-law warned him to stay longer, and also, since Jacob still feared Esau, why did he leave Laban? And uh, why did he start for home? Well, the answer is simple. Because Elham asked him to, saying in Genesis 31 13, I am the Elham of Bethel. Uh, actually, I am the Yahshua of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou bowest a bow unto me. Now arise, get thee out from this land, and return unto the land of thy kindred. From this record you see Jacob was faithful as his post to be, and always mindful of the Elohim's command. Are we like Jacob? Or are we like Judas' carrot? Okay. But as Jacob now, you know, took perfect care of the Laban's business, and followed Elohim's direction all the way. 
that Judas Iscariot took perfect care of his own selfish interest at the expense of the Elohim's gift, and rather than following the Yahshua's directions, he followed his own. Now they'll compare uh, Jacob's end with that of the Judas. One's work ended in glory, and the other's work ended in the shame and disaster. For whom are you working, brother sister? For yourselves or for the Elohim? You say for the uh, for the for the Yahweh. I hope you are right. But remember, as I said before, that no business firm will promote a worker that is not interested at least as much in the prosperity of his firm as he is in the size of his, of his wages. Moreover, no firm is interested in the workman's private business. It is interested in its own business. That's Elohim's business, though it is far more important, though it is far more important than of the far greater consequence than the business of any man. He too is not at all interested in your selfish business. He is interested in his business of a saving soul. You cannot therefore make your own interest of the Elohim importance uh, and, his and his of the second, and at the same time expect to reap the, the promises and expect him to answer your prayer. If such be the case, then you are even falsely calling yourself a Christian, according to Matthew 6, 32. You are still a deluded Gentile. Okay, let's continue. To be a Christian in Elohim's sight, you must never praise yourself, but praise Elohim and his goodness. Never boast of your own interest and achievement. Verily, boast of the Elohim. Never try to promote your business, but always try to promote Elohim. Never pray for life to know what to do and where to go in order that your business, your interest prosper, but rather pray for the life that Elohim help you to do the thing or go to the place where you would best serve his child, that he leads you and teach you how to advance his kingdom. Then and then only will you find that you, you never go wrong. Any motive other than this will take you where Elohim does not want you and where you will have to carry your own burden independent of him. I have seen a number of individuals swear by the heaven and earth that Elohim has led them here and there into this or into the other, but when things did not please them, then they packed away swearing just as hard that Elohim had not led them into the thing. And again, uh, swear just as hard as before that Elohim has taken them out of it and into something better. They again felt just as positive that Elohim was leading in their move, though it was the opposite of what they thought he had led them in before. Others have felt that Elohim had opened the way for them to do this or the other by the fact that they had been able to get the money for the trip or to get a buyer for one thing or another, to have this and to have that. Still others told me that they opened the Bible at random and that their eyes dropped on a verse which indicated Elohim's approval of their move. One brother told me that he had flipped the coin and another had found an Indian arrow pointing in the direction he should go. All these I have seen come to naught, although these indications were held as positive evidences of the Elohim's will and the matters under the question. Let me now tell you that these indications in themselves are but presumption of the highest form, hallucination and gambling, not Elohim's signs at all. Moreover, uh, anyone's plans which are based on purely selfish interest, based purely on where and how one may better his private pro uh, Prophet making projects while he professes to be a Christian, I tell you that all these are schemes, not Elohim's plans at all, regardless how the way opens or what happens. The fact is that Elohim has never given the opportunity to direct in these things. For to give him the opportunity, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of Elohim and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you.
When you therefore make the kingdom of the Elohim your chief interest, then you will most likely and uh, most surely find yourself in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing and reaping Elohim's richest blessing. You can then rest assured that he will open the way and take you where you need to be, even if he has to lift you out of the well and to tell the Ishmaelites to carry you into Egypt and to put you working in the Potiphar's house. He may even have to take you into prison before he, uh, he seats you with the Pharaoh on the throne. Or he may cause you uh, to run away from Egypt and have you keep sheep around uh, Mount Horeb. He may bring you uh, against the Red Sea while the Egyptians are pursuing you. He may bring you into the desert where there is neither water nor food. For the lion and the bear may come to take your land, the lion to kill your people, and the king may cast you in the fire furnace or in the lion's den. Yes, hundreds and thousands of things ha may happen, but he that trusts in the Elohim and does his work well shall find all these so-called hindrances or mishaps, wonderful deliverances, and avenues to success all carrying out the Elohim's marvelous plan and Elohim's way toward your promotion from one great thing to another. When you are in the Elohim's care and in his control, never say the devil did this or that regardless what he what it be, for he can do nothing except he is allowed to do it. Always give Elohim the credit. Uh, when I came to America, not because I wanted to, uh, really because Elohim wanted me to. And since I knew not my future work, and as Elohim could then no more make me understand than he could at first make Joseph understand his trip into Egypt, I was therefore driven out of the country at the point of a gun, as was Moses driven out of Egypt. Although I had done nothing to bring trouble upon myself, and who do you suppose led the rebels to storm me out of the country? None other but the Greek Orthodox Bishop of the province. And where do you suppose he sponsored his pursuing campaign? In the church on Sunday morning while in a full regalia and about 20 feet from where I stood. At that time I knew not what my going away from home to such a distant land was about. But now I know, as well as the Joseph knew, that his brethren's hope to defeat Elohim's plan for him was but Elohim's plan to get him down into Egypt, and so rather than to thwart the plan, they really caused the plan to be carried out. When things go contrary to one's will and way today, most Christians give credit unto the devil. Only when things go according to their liking, do they give credit unto the Elohim. Balaam, too, was happy when the way opened for him to go to Balaam, but when the angel of the Yahweh blocked the road he was traveling on, then the Balaam became as mad as a dog and smote the ass. Uh, no, nothing but you yourself can defeat Elohim's plan for you, be it your friends or your enemy, be it beast or king. You will find them all unwittingly or willingly working for your good rather than for your harm. If you are doing Elohim's bidding, what a rich resource heaven is. And who knows it? Remember now that whatever may stand in your way, be it the Red Sea or the River Jordan, be it a mountain or be it a desert, it shall become your very stepping stone. Such as this is the righteous of the Yahshua, and you can uh, have it at the cost of your own righteousness, then you will find the Yahshua's way as much higher than yours as the heaven is higher than the earth. When this happens, then only you will understandably say, the Yahshua are righteousness. There it is, the Yahshua are righteousness. Thou shalt keep him in the perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. Trust in the Yahshua forever, for in the Yahshua Messiah is the everlasting strength, for he bringeth 
There are men that dwell on the high, the lofty city, he lays it low. He lays it low even underground. He brings it even unto the dust. For the foot shall tread it down, even the feet of the poor and the steps of the knee. Isaiah 26, 3 to 6. Okay, this is the end of our study on uh, Town of Reading, Volume number 35. Now we will close this service. The last seven minutes was reading scriptures about righteousness from the book of Psalms. We're on Psalm 72, verse 3. For the mountains shall bring peace unto the people, and the little hills by their righteousness. Psalm 85, 10. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Uh, verse 11. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from the heaven. Verse 13, Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. It's talking about Yahshua. Psalms 88, 12, and Shall thy wonders be known in the dark, and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? Psalms 89, 16, In thy name shall they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. Why is the house of David going to be exalted today? Because of his righteousness of the Yahshua. Psalms 94, 15. But judgment shall return unto the righteousness, and all the upright in the heart shall follow it. Psalms 96, 13. Before the Yahshua, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, he shall judge the world with the righteousness, Righteousness and the people with his truth. Psalm 97 2. Clouds and darkness are around about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. Psalm 97 6. The heavens declare his righteousness and all the people see his glory. Psalm 98 2. Yahshua hath made a known uh, of his salvation, for his righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. Psalm 98.9 Before the Yahshua, for he cometh to judge the earth with the righteous, and shall judge the world and the people with equity. Psalm 99.4 Okay, let's see what we have here. Uh, it says, for the king's strength also loveth judgment. Thou dost establish equity, thou executest judgment and righteousness in Jacob. This is talking about the 144,000 now. That's why they come forth out of the spiritual Israel Adventist church of the day. They're co-mingled right now, they had been with the wheat and the tares. Uh, the 144,000, the righteous representing the wheat. Psalms 103, verse 6. For the Yahshua executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. Okay. So it says in Psalm 103, verse 17, But the mercy of the Yahshua is from everlasting unto everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto the children's children. Psalm 106, verse 3. Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Verse 31, and that was counted unto him for righteousness unto all generations forevermore. Psalm 111, verse 3, his work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. It says his work is honorable. Psalm 112, verse 3, wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. So the righteousness of this house of David endures forever. Psalm 104, verse 9. He hath dispersed, he hath given unto the poor, his righteousness endures forever. His horn shall be exalted with the honor. And today we are that horn of the antichrical David. The house of David, the, tri uh, the, the tribe of Judah, the lawgiver with Yahshua, as the king sitting upon his throne of this tribe of Jesus, the house of David, the mountain of the house of Yahweh, Isaiah 2, Micah, verse 4. 
the mountain of the house of Yahweh shall be established in the top of the mountains of all the mountains. Psalm 118, verse 19. Open unto me the gates of the righteous, I will go unto them, and I will praise the uh, Yahshua. Psalm, Psalm 119, verse 40. Behold, I have long after thy precepts quickened thee in my, thy righteousness. Psalm 119, 123. Mine eyes fail of thy salvation, and uh, for the word of uh, thy righteousness. Psalm 119, 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is with the truth. Psalm 19, 144. For the righteousness of thy testimony is uh, with the everlasting. Give unto me understanding, and I shall live. Psalm 19, 172. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are in. Uh, in the righteousness. Psalm 132, 9. Let thy priests be filled with the righteous, and let thy saints shout for the joy. Hear my prayer, O Yahweh. Give ear unto my supplication in thy faithfulness. Answer me, and in thy righteousness. we got about one more minute to go before we uh, close with the psalm. Psalm 143, 11. Quicken me, O Yahshua, for thy name's sake. For thy righteousness shall make my soul out of the bring my soul out of the trouble. Psalms 145, 7. Thou shalt abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. Psalms of Proverbs 2 verse 9. Thou shalt then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. Okay, Savior like a shepherd lead us. Savior like a shepherd lead us, must we meet thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us, oh, are ye suffer prepared. This is Yashua, this is Yashua, Thou hast brought us kindly heart. This is Yashua, this is Yashua, Oh, hear us when we pray. We are thine, we have befriended us, We the guardian of our way. From sin defend us, seek us when we go astray. This is Yashua, this is Yashua, oh hear us when we pray. This is Yashua, this is Yashua, hear, oh hear us when we pray. Thou hast promised to be Blessed Yahshua, blessed Yahshua, 